Did you like our sign? <coughs> Those are fluorescent light tubes. <coughs> At home, in your fixtures, you turn on the power. <coughs> An electric field is generated. It excites the gas molecules in the tube. When they drop back down to a lower energy state, they give off some of that energy, and that causes the tube to fluoresce or give off light. Here, they're not hooked up to anything electrically. They're just tied onto a piece of wood. We use a Tesla coil to generate a strong electric field. In fact, <coughs> the field is so strong, it caused the air to break down and become a conductor. And that's what lightning is. We made a little bit of lightning today. <coughs> As you can see, I had a little too much fun over winter break. <coughs> I fell skiing. The good news is no surgery. The bad news is I'm going to be on crutches for six weeks while the bone mends. And uh, you know what they say, the show must go on. So we're, <coughs> so no, no holdups today, we're good to go. Also, uh, I made a little modification. <coughs> I added a cup holder and I'm doing much better now. <coughs> I always like to start by asking you a question. If this is your first time to a physics show, give yourselves a round of applause. OK, welcome. And if you've been to one or more shows before, give yourselves a round of applause. OK, welcome back. <coughs> we have been doing this show a long time. This is me today, and there I was preparing for the first show. <laughs> no, that wasn't me. That was my son. He was five there. He's a freshman in high school now. As you can see, he still drinks chocolate milk. <laughs> but he's traded in the crackers for an iPhone. <laughs> Ten years. <clears throat> I like to uh, start off by telling you a little bit about what physics is all about, right? And physics tries to explain the world we live in. Physics tries to explain the world we live in. When you're in school, you learn all kinds of wonderful things, right? You could almost put them into categories. You're reading and writing and your history and your math. One of those categories is science, right? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Give it up for science. That's good. <coughs> and science, there are so many wonderful things under science. You, you could put those into different categories, right? Your chemistry and your biology and geology. One of those categories is physics. And physics, because physics tries to explain the world we live in, and that's a lot of stuff, there are lots of categories even under physics. Why, uh, why the sky is blue, right? Why how your refrigerator works. Why your backpack slides off the seat next to you onto the floor when the car breaks suddenly, right? All these things. <clears throat> so I like to say physics is a journey, and we're so happy you're coming along with us on that journey. Uh, the community around Foothill College is very supportive of the college. We appreciate it very much. We're delighted we could put a show like this on for you. Today we're going to talk about light, sound, resonance, and pressure. And I would like to introduce the other uh, presenters today. Foothill physics instructor David Marasco. <clears throat> and we have a couple of students. We love to show off our students. Rachel Major. And Olga Kritova. <laughs> I'm Frank Coscarano. <clears throat> and you know what I like to say? If you can't have fun with physics, you aren't a very fun person. <laughs> so let's get started. Let's have some fun. We're starting off with light. <clears throat> and all of this stuff is really the same. It's all electromagnetic waves, radio waves, microwaves, infrared. Maybe you've seen a movie about the military and they've got those night vision goggles on. They are looking at things in the infrared part of the spectrum. It's all the same stuff. We just give it different names for some reason. Uh, some animals sleep during the day and come out at night and their eyes can see in the infrared. Our eyes cannot. We can't see any of this stuff. Our eyes are tuned to the sun, the light that comes from the sun, visible light. 
and those are the different colors of the rainbow. If you break up the white light, you get the different colors. And if you go beyond that, we can't see this either. This is ultraviolet. That's the stuff that gives us sunburns, x-rays. It's all the same stuff, but we give it different names for some reason. Our eyes are tuned to visible part of the spectrum. That's all we can see. But all of it has an interesting property. <coughs> light, when it goes from one medium to another, oftentimes it changes speed. So if this is air and this slab in the middle is glass, the, the light would slow down. And if you imagine the light as having a sort of a thickness to it, the wave of having a little uh, width to it, part of it hits the slow material first and goes slow, while part of it is still going fast. And what happens is it changes direction slightly. We call that refraction. And because of that, we can do some interesting things. So let's take a look at what I have over here. This is my uh, slab of uh, glass. And I've got light coming in. We'll turn the lights down. And you can see the light comes in. And it's coming in straight or perpendicular to the surface, so it comes out straight on the other side. But if I bring it in at an angle, then maybe we can see that it changes direction a little bit. It comes in in one direction, and when it hits the glass here, it, the angle changes slightly. And when it comes out of the glass on this side, it changes back to where it was. So you can see that the path changes direction a little bit. That's called refraction. And because of that, we can do some interesting things. So let's, let me show you here. I have a model of the eye. Okay, that's the eye, <coughs> a human eye. And we have a lens. So if we had no lens here, the light would come in and it wouldn't focus on the back where our receptors are. Our receptors are back here. And so this would just be a really blurry image. We wouldn't be able to see anything. But luckily, we have a lens in our eye, and it causes the light to focus. And it focuses where my finger is here on the back of the eye where our receptors are. So this eye is working properly, and this person can see a nice, clear image there. Sometimes our eyes don't work as well. The lens doesn't focus the light in the right place. This eye is focusing the light here, so back here, it's not a nice sharp image, it's blurry. So what do we do? We put on glasses, and now the light is focused in the right place here. Take the glasses off, put the glasses on, it changes the where the light's focused, now we can see. So glasses, that's just one uh, example. Anytime we're focusing light, there are other examples though, we can take a look here. Telescopes, cameras, magnifying glasses, uh, glasses, <coughs> all of these things. Any place where we're focusing light, we can take advantage of refraction. And then that, what I've been talking about there is when the light is going from a fast to a slow medium, right? Air to glass. What if it's the other way around? What if the light starts in the glass and tries to go into the air, it bends the opposite direction. So at some point, it can't bend enough. It can't get out. It's all reflected back in. The light's trying to get out, but it all gets reflected back in. Nothing can escape. We call that total internal reflection. And I'm going to show you that with this little plexiglass tube I have. This plexiglass uh, piece is coiled up here. And watch the straight section, the laser light coming in. I'm going to point it up towards the top, and it can't get out. It bounces back in. Now I'm going to point it towards the bottom. It can't get out. You can see the reflections taking place in there, right? But it can't get out. And if you look at the center of that coil, that piece is pointing right at the end of the tube, is pointing right at the camera. That's where the, the light's going. Okay, total internal reflection. And uh, Olga and Rachel are going to tell you a little bit more about total internal reflection. We've just learned about total internal reflection with the plexiglass shape. Turns out that a water stream can also demonstrate total internal reflection. So what we have here is a contraption, two tubes, and on one side there's a hole where the water's going to come out. On the other side, there's a clear glass panel where the laser is going to shoot through to the other side. So we'll connect that. You can see kind of on the wall over there, on my hand as well, the laser is shooting straight through. So now we're going to pour water 
into the tubes and see what happens. And I'm going to place my hand over the hole just so it can build up and because we lost the cork. <laughs> So you can see the laser is following the path of the water's arc. And I can even put my hand here and you can see the laser. to point out about this demonstration is that even as the water is running low and that arc is getting smaller and smaller, the laser still follows the path. You can still see it as it keeps draining out. You can plug it if you want to, but okay. <laughs> So we've just learned about total internal reflection, which is this property that when light is inside of a material, it bounces around inside the material and doesn't leave. Turns out you can also use light to transport information. If you combine these ideas together, you get fiber optic cables. And fiber optic cables are found all over the world. Have you guys ever used, it's like this little thing, it's kind of abstract, you've probably never ever heard of it, called the internet? You have heard about it? Good. How about cell phones? Yeah? Uh, where is the, there it is. So if you've used these things, you've used fiber optic cables. And you can see with this spool, it's round, round, and round, and round, but the light is still coming out at the end of the cable. You guys see that on the camera? a little bit, and you've even block, there you go, there you go, point it at the camera, what, oh, point it, okay, there you go, <laughs> and you can even block the laser light and see that it doesn't transport through the cable. So the next time you guys use your cell phone or send an email, send a text, think about these awesome cables that you're using that make it all possible. Light has an interesting property. It can go through some materials. We say they are transparent, like the glass windows in our house, in our car. And it can't get through others. We say they are opaque, like the walls of our house. So what makes the material transparent or opaque is whether it can absorb the light or not. If the atoms and molecules that make up the material can't absorb the exact energy the light's carrying, the light goes through without being absorbed. That material is transparent. If the atoms and molecules can absorb it, they have to be able to absorb just the exact right amount of energy, then the light disappears, it gets absorbed, and the energy that it's carrying goes into the material, heats it up a little bit. And David's gonna tell us a little bit more about opaque and transparent in different parts of the spectrum. So I just plugged in a heating filament. It's kind of like the inside of an oven. And as it heats up, after a while, it'll start to glow. And we're kind of used to this idea. You go outside, you see the sun, it's glowing because it's hot. You turn on your toaster, you can look inside your toaster, it's glowing because it's hot. And they're glowing in the visible because they're very hot. It turns out, I can put my hand right here, I can feel the heat. That means it's glowing, but I can't see it because our eyes are not attuned to that part of the spectrum. This is actually glowing fairly strongly in the infrared. Now what Frank just set up was an infrared camera. If we focus in on the infrared camera, what you can see there is you can see the image of our heating filament right there. So if you had eyes that could see in the infrared, you'd be able to see the glow 
before this heated up to the point where it starts glowing orange. And then another you know, 30 seconds or so, this will become orange and you'll be able to see it with your eyes. In fact, I can start to see it right now. Now, Frank had talked about transparent and opaque. Can you see me right now? So is this transparent or opaque? It's transparent and the visible. The light that we use in our eyes can go right through this. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this plastic uh, sheet in between my heat source and my infrared camera. Went away. So for infrared light, is this transparent or opaque? Opaque. The infrared light does not go through. We're going to shift gears. You might have one of these at home. I hope you have something similar to it at home. For the visible, is this transparent or opaque? Opaque. We can't see through it. On the other hand, I can do this. The infrared light goes right through it. So in the infrared, this is transparent, even though it's opaque for our eyes. So what's transparent in one part of the spectrum could be opaque in the other part and vice versa. Now we're going to have a little fun with the infrared camera. We're going to take a picture of Frank. <laughs> this is all fair because you're going to see a picture of me in the x-ray later on. Oh, look at Frank. <laughs> look at that movie star. Now I want you to look at his eyes. Okay, they look very different than the rest of his face. Now he's going to lift his glasses. <laughs> Look how bright his eyes are. Okay, now he puts his glasses back down. And what you can see there is that the signal from his eyes is being blocked by his glasses. Now his glasses are transparent in the visible because they'd be really bad glasses if they weren't transparent in the visible. <laughs> But because they're made out of glass, they're opaque in the infrared. Now, you actually know this. You say, how do I know this? Well, because when you go into your car on a nice summer day, you say, oh, my car is super hot inside. Why is it super hot? Well, because the sunlight, which is visible, will go through the windows in your car, and then it'll come down, and it'll heat up your seats and your dashboard and all of that. And when your seats and your dashboard try to shed that heat, they try and shed the heat using infrared light. But the infrared light tries to go through your windows, and it gets blocked by the glass. And that's going to trap the heat in your car. Now, we can use infrared light in a lot of different places. A place where it's used a lot is in astronomy. Now, I read that it's not going to rain tonight. I hope that means there aren't going to be any clouds tonight because I'd like everybody tonight to try and find that constellation there. Okay? That's Orion. That's my favorite. Those three stars right there, Orion's belt. Up there, that red star is Betelgeuse. Blue star down here is Rigel. Frank, in a couple minutes, will tell us the difference between red stars and blue stars. So when you look up at the sky tonight, if there are no clouds, that's what you will see. Minus, of course, all of those lines. You could draw those in because we have imagination. If our eyes could see in the infrared, we'd see a very different picture. We'd see stuff going on over here and up here and down here. And you say, well, what is that? Those are objects that aren't hot enough to glow in the visible yet. So action's going on, but you can't detect it with a normal telescope. You can only detect it with an infrared telescope. Infrared telescopes can do other great things. So out in the galaxy, we have dust and gas. And the dust and gas are kind of like this bag. They block visible light. So if you took a normal telescope, aimed it at the galactic center, you'd end up seeing just a lot of gas and dust. And all of the light from the center of our galaxy gets blocked. So all of the visible light, the infrared light from the center of our galaxy, punches right through. So now you're thinking, well, I already own a telescope. Maybe I should go out and buy an infrared telescope. If you did that, you'd discover something 
you discover that our atmosphere kind of looks like this. For visible light, it goes right through. We can see the stars, we can see the sun. But for infrared light, that gets blocked by our atmosphere. So NASA has to do things like this. That's a 747, and they kind of put a garage door on it. And it'll fly way up in the atmosphere, above most of the atmosphere. It'll open up the garage door, and then a little, well, actually a quite big infrared telescope will poke out. And they'll say, well, What's going on down here? NASA's got a special program for good-looking science instructors to fly on <laughs> Sophia. They made an exception for me. <laughs> so for about a week last spring, I got to fly on Sophia, the 747, and watch the scientists use their telescope. And we looked at the galactic core. We looked at asteroids in our own solar system. It turns out in infrared, the signature for water is very distinct, so we could learn about water in our early solar system. So NASA can use instruments like SOFIA to learn more about our universe than just in the visible. And we actually have all kinds of instruments to look through all parts of the spectrum, and Frank is going to tell us more about the spectrum. It turns out that everything gives off energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. If something is super, super, super cold, it gives off really low energy waves, something like a radio wave. And as you warm it up, it starts to give off more and more energetic waves. Eventually, it gets warm enough, like about the temperature of you and I, where we give off infrared. And if you warm it up even more, you start to see some visible light. It starts to glow red hot, like that heating element we had here earlier. And if you warm it up even more, it starts to give off all the colors of light. And all the colors of light make white. So it glows white hot. White hot is hotter than red hot. And if you heat it up even more, it would look blue. And if you heat it up even more, it would give off ultraviolet and eventually x-rays. So when you look at the stars tonight, some of them look red. They are cooler than our star. They're cooler than the sun, so they give off more red light. Some look blue, they're hotter than our, our star, they're hotter than the sun. And some look white, they're giving off the same colors, they're about the same temperature as the sun. And now David's going to talk a little bit more about light and rainbows. So this slide is telling us about a very old experiment. It was done by Sir Isaac Newton centuries ago. And what he did is he took white light and he put it into a special piece of glass called a prism. And what the prism does is it refracts the light. Now, Frank taught us about refraction maybe 10 minutes ago, but he left out a detail. And the detail is that different colors get refracted by different amounts. So you can take white light in, and white light is made up of all of the different colors. And when it refracts, the red light will refract differently than the green and the purple, and that's why it gets spread out into a rainbow. So we're going to do a... Uh, repeat of that experiment today, we're going to make a rainbow, only we're not going to use a prism. We're going to use some old school equipment here. <laughs> the grown-ups know what this is, right? <laughs> Don't know about the kids. I'm going to have to explain it for the kids. So what we have that here is an old-timey overhead projector. It's got a very bright lamp down here. It sends light straight upwards. It bounces off a mirror through a lens, and we're trying to throw white light in that direction. Now, what we've done to modify this is we've taped something called a diffraction grating across the front of our overhead projector. And what the diffraction grating does is it takes the white light and breaks it up into all the different colors in our spectrum. So I'm going to fire up our overhead projector. Over here, you can see the white light that went straight through. And then over here, we've got our spectrum. Kids, do we know these colors? Yeah, you do. What's that? Yeah, those are all of the colors we've got in our rainbow. Now, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton did something interesting. 
Not only did he take all of the white light and split it up in the different colors of the rainbow, he did something very inventive. Once he had that, he took the different colors of the rainbow and then he fed it through a second prism. And when he did that, he recombined all of the different colors back into white light. That's going to be the next thing we're going to try. And I love this part of the demonstration because it lets me play one of my favorite games. You kids have played this game before. It's called red light, green light. <laughs> okay, when I say red light, I want everybody to say red light. Are you ready? Red light. Red light. And the people up in the booth have given us a nice red light. We all know what's going to happen next, right? Yeah. Green light. And we get kind of a surprise, OK? We have red light over here. They added in green light. And where the red light and the green light overlap, we get yellow light. Now, the first time I saw this, I was a little bit surprised because I've been to kindergarten. <laughs> and in kindergarten, they teach us about primary colors. And they teach us that our primary colors are red, yellow, and blue, and you can make all the different colors out of red, yellow, and blue. And it turns out those, those rules work well for things like crayons and paint, but when you're actually dealing with light, your primary colors are red and green, and if we can have a little blue, we'll find out that blue is our third primary color. There's our blue. When they overlap, the red and the green and the blue combine and make white light. Now, when I was a kid, I used to get into trouble a lot. That's probably why I'm a physicist today. <laughs> now, one of the things my mom always used to tell me when I was getting in trouble was, don't sit so close to the television, you're going to hurt your eyes. She was right. Listen to your mom. But if you do take a very close look at a television screen or a computer monitor, you'll discover something. It's not putting out all of those millions of colors you think it is. If you look very closely, all it's doing is red, green, and blue. The red, the green, and the blue go into our eyes. They get combined. Our brain takes them and turns them into all the different colors. Okay. Now. The next question you might ask is, well, is that what my color printer is doing? Is that taking red, green, and blue and giving me all the different colors? The answer is no. It's doing something slightly different. It's using a different set of primary colors. It's using yellow. This beautiful color down here is cyan. And over here, this is magenta. And what your color printer does is it takes yellow, cyan, magenta, sometimes adds in a little black to make the colors pop. But all the colors that you see coming out of your color printer, once again, are coming out of a very small set of colors, the yellow, cyan, magenta, and they add in black. So what we've seen here is that we can get all of our colors out of different sets of primary color groups. Okay, We're going to turn down the blue and the green. And people are going to come here next, and they have a question for you about what your eyes are seeing. So, can you guys tell me what color this poster is? Well, you got to know what color we're shining on it first, though, right? We have the white light on. It's a white poster. So, why does it look white when, in fact, it looked red before? Well, every object reflects a certain type of color. If we shine white light on it, it reflects all colors because it's a white object. This stage is black, and if we shine white light on it, it looks black because all of the color gets absorbed. And if we have a red object, it absorbs all colors except for red, which gets reflected back into your eyes, and you see red. So if we can get the red light on, please. My friend here is going to switch the poster sides. What color is this poster? <laughs> yeah? Well, if we get the white light on, you can see it's actually a little bit of both. The inside material is a little bit red. The outside material is white. So this side, this little bit, reflects red light. 
this bit reflects red light as well when the red light's on it. So next time that you see an object of a certain color, think about what light's being reflected and what light is being absorbed. We're talking about light. We're talking about color. We've got to talk about why the sky is blue, don't we? The sky is blue because the atmosphere has lots of little tiny particles in it. And little tiny particles scatter light. It causes it to go in different directions. <clears throat> and little tiny particles scatter light preferentially. That means different for the different colors. Blue light scatters the most. In other words, if we're trying to shine blue light straight through a bunch of little particles, we can't do it. It ends up getting scattered out in different directions. It won't go straight through. But red light doesn't get scattered very much. So if we're trying to shine red light through a bunch of particles, it has a chance of making it out the other end. Now, big particles don't do that. Big particles scatter all light about the same. So when you look at a cloud, a cloud is made up of much larger sized particles than our atmosphere. It scatters all the colors of light about the same. Clouds typically look white. So, uh, so this, when you look right at the sun, you see, of course, white. But when you look off to the side, you see the blue light that's getting scattered back to your eye. And when the sun is going down and you look directly at it, there's a really long path through the atmosphere that light has to take. So the blue light has been scattered out and the only thing that has a chance of making it through is the red. So sunsets typically look red. Now let's see if we can do that for you. So we have here something that is representing the, uh, the sun, this light, and the light is coming in this direction through the liquid. The liquid represents our atmosphere. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little chemical reaction take place here. And the chemical reaction is going to form little tiny particles. And as it forms more and more little particles, it's as if the sun is setting. We'll get that started. Now, the camera can't look in two different directions at the same time. So it's looking edge on. So this part should look like our blue sky. But if you look directly at the sun, that's what you would see. That's I put this screen here. This is what it looks like when you look directly at the sun. And right now, the sun looks white because it's overhead. And there's a very small distance the light's coming. We're seeing all the colors of light. But as the sun sets, the light goes through more and more particles. And so what I'm doing here is I'm creating more and more particles as time goes on. And we should be able to see this appearing blue and this uh, appearing sort of orange and red. So we'll turn the lights down a little bit. And when we dim the lights, we'll be able to see uh, the path. So you can see in, in this region, in the liquid, you can see I'll move the light a little bit. See the path that the light's taking? That's because there are particles forming in there now. You can see the light being scattered by those particles. And it sort of has a little bit of a blue tint to it, don't you think? And as time goes on here, this light is starting to look a little yellow to me now. It looked white earlier. And we'll let more particles form. That's a stirring sunset, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that romantic? This is starting to look like a sunset, a little more orange, right? And this is starting to look bluish, our blue sky and our red orange sunset. And we're going to wait just a little bit longer. And I think the sun actually is going to set.
So we've been talking <clears throat> about light, and we've tried to pick topics that you're familiar with, that you've seen every day. Uh, we talked about blue skies and red sunsets, and in fact, it's pretty well known that when there's a volcano eruption somewhere in the world, their sunsets become much more vivid because there are a lot more particles in the air. We talked about fiber optic cables. There's enough fiber optic cable to go around the earth over 22 times under all the oceans. One of the greatest engineering feats of modern day is running all that fiber optic cable. We know why this sports car looks red because it is absorbing every color except for red and it reflects red light back to our eyes. We know why it gets hot in there because light, visible light, carries energy in through the windows. It gets absorbed by the seats. The seats try to give off infrared, but it can't get out. It's a one-way ticket for energy, and the inside of your car gets hot. We talked about rainbows, and we talked about transparency and opaque. David promised a picture of him in an x-ray part of the spectrum. You can see that the x-rays go right through skin and muscle, but not through bones or his pacemaker. The physics of light all around us in our everyday lives. We're going to talk about sound now. Sound is caused by something vibrating, something wiggling back and forth really fast. Our speakers at home have that cone in them. They vibrate in and out really fast. They push on the air molecules. The air molecules push on their neighbors. They push on their neighbors. Eventually, air molecules push on your eardrum. We perceive that as sound. Tuning forks vibrate back and forth, make a certain sound, right? Maybe you use those to tune your musical instrument. Even our vocal cords vibrate and make sound. In fact, let's do this. Let's do that little test, maybe just to show you. We'll have you touch your throat, and we'll sing a little note here, OK? La. D, da, la, di, da. Did you feel it? Could you feel your fingers tingling from the vibration? Yeah, your vocal cords vibrate. Vibration causes sound, OK? <clears throat> and uh, in fact, I have a little, uh, a little model I like to use. To, to just to illustrate that, to help visualize what might be happening there. If this is our, uh, if this is our mouth and vocal cords, this will be our vocal cords. I'm going to make it vibrate by tapping on it. It's going to push on the air molecules in our mouth. And of course, our mouth has an opening on one side, right? And uh, the air molecules push on their neighbors. They push on their neighbors. Eventually, they push on an eardrum. And this t-shirt will be an eardrum. Uh, that David's going to hold up, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of get a visual of what's happening. So <clears throat> I'll hold up uh, my pen, and I'll make it vibrate. And let me do it this way. OK. That gives you a little visual of what, how sound moves. And we say sound is a wave. Maybe you've been at the ocean. You've seen the waves at the ocean. The water kind of rises up and goes back down. And that disturbance moves, right? The water doesn't move. The disturbance moves. In fact, I think this might be a good illustration. Maybe you remember back a few years, this used to be very popular, doing the wave at a sporting event. Yeah. Maybe you don't remember that. We haven't done that for a while. But we're going to have you do it today. And I'll, I'll teach you. And hopefully, your quicker learners in our audience yesterday, because they had a lot of trouble, <laughs> a lot of trouble with the wave, right? And you don't want me talking about you later on today, right? So, uh, so this is how the wave works. We're going to start with the people sitting all the way in that last row up against the wall, right? And I'm going to count down. And when I tell them, they're all going to stand up and sit right back down at the same time. And the person next to them is going to wait. So I'm going to stand up, 
and sit down, and then David's going to stand up and sit down. And then the person next to them will do it. You wait until the person on your right stands up before you stand up. So there's a little bit of a delay, you understand? <laughs> the people on this side of the aisle, they have to watch the people on the other side of the aisle, right? So you wait till the person next to you stands up, and then you stand up. And if you don't feel like standing up, throw your arms up in the air, okay? Are we ready? Okay. Three, two, one. There we go. <laughs> should we should we try that again or should we just make fun of you later? <clears throat> okay, you got the idea, right? Now, did you get up and move across the room? No, you just got up and down, moved a little bit right where you are, right? But that disturbance kind of moved across the room, right? That's what happens in a wave. And so David's going to show us on a spring what happens. He's going to make a little disturbance. And what happens? That disturbance travels along the spring. He's going to do it again. Now, what happens when it gets to the end? It bounces back, it gets reflected back. And if he makes a lot of disturbances, sometimes they interfere in a really nice way. That's what he's getting here, it's called a standing wave. Now look at his hand, how much is his hand going up and down? Not very much, right? How much is the spring going up and down in the middle? A lot, all those little tiny disturbances are adding together to give you a big disturbance in the center. If this was a sound wave, it would be really loud in the center. Now he's gonna go a little faster. There we go. And in the center where the spring is not going up and down at all, that's, if this was a sound wave, it would be quiet there. In fact, we can make it quiet by adding more sound to something if we add it just right. That's how noise canceling headphones work. Now he's gonna try for three. There we go. Now he's gonna quit while he's ahead. So this is, a, this is a spring, those are standing waves on a spring, and uh, because of the interference of the waves bouncing back and the waves he's putting in. And what, we're, what we want to do is show you that with sound waves now, because sound is also a wave, and David's going to explain how we're going to do that. First I'm going to point out that the great thing about the physics show is that a lot of these demonstrations you should just go home and try. So. That one where we saw the water trapping the laser, you can do that at home. Just get yourself a nice clear two liter bottle, fill it up with water, poke a hole down near the bottom. If you've got a laser pointer and you line things up just right, you can repeat that experiment in your bathtub, okay? If you go to our Facebook page, right now we've got a video where you can measure the speed of light using a microwave oven and chocolate. And if it doesn't work, you've got chocolate. So there are a lot of these experiments that you should just go home and try. Do not try this experiment at home. <laughs> we have our fire extinguisher right here just in case. Now, why would we need to use a fire extinguisher? Because we're gonna play with fire. Do not try this at home. So we've got this pipe. We're flowing propane into it. We've got little tiny holes drilled at the top of the pipe. So Frank is gonna light this. We're gonna get little tiny gas jets coming up, jets of flame. Easy there, Frank. On this end, we've got a speaker. And Frank is gonna send sound waves into the pipe and they're gonna go down the pipe, hit this end, they're gonna reflect come back and as they reflect and come back and meet the incoming waves, it's like me sending waves into the spring and the wave bouncing backs. And you'll get what I had on that spring. Remember I could wiggle it and get three bumps? Well, here are one, two, three bumps. Maybe a baby bump over there. Not that kind of baby bump. <laughs> but also we have these regions where you have no uh, 
snow flame. That's where it was canceling out. Okay, so Frank, he's going to wiggle faster. He's going to give us a higher frequency. going to keep going? That's sounding pretty good, Frank. One, two, three, four, five. Frank's feeling lucky. So we've got all the way up to six. Frank is feeling very lucky. Now, that's a fun demonstration, and we could probably do that all day. And if we didn't have three physics shows, we might do it all day. <laughs> but as we kept going, we kept going to a higher and higher frequency. And just like me shaking on the spring with a faster frequency, we got more of those bumps each time we went to a higher frequency. Now, at a certain point, we'd keep getting more and more bumps, but we would stop hearing the sound. And why would we stop hearing the sound? Because our ears only cover a certain range of frequency. So that's what we're going to learn next. We're going to learn about the range of human hearing. OK. So we, like uh, David just said, we're going to learn a little bit about range of human hearing. Now, the textbook definition of our range is between 20 to 20,000 hertz. That's quite a big range, but we're gonna try with this function generator, it's the thing that made those little bumps over there. We're gonna use this function generator to produce a sound, and we're gonna go from about 100 up to 10,000, and at 10,000, we're gonna ask you to raise your hands. But this is one you guys wanna listen for. So, we're starting off with 10,000, uh, can you guys hear this? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to go up little by little. This is two uh, 200. 300. 400. That's 1,000. 2,000. 3,000. 4. This is 10,000. Now, everybody, including the parents, raise your hands. And I want you to keep them up until you can't hear it anymore, OK? Now keep them raised until you can't hear it. I'm going to go till I can't hear it. 11,000, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I can't hear this. Now kids, take a look around you. All the parents have their hands down, right? <laughs> so you can all lower your hands. So why is this? Well, it typically is because, okay, guy. <laughs> it's typically because as we get older, the first thing that we lose in terms of our hearing is our high frequency sound. It's between that 15 to 20,000 range which means you really want to take good care of your ears, don't listen to music too loudly, don't go to too many concerts, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It is the physics show. We had to put one equation on the board. <coughs> this tells us the velocity, the speed of a wave equals the frequency times the wavelength. When we talk, when I'm talking to you right now, the speed of sound doesn't really change from day to day. It's pretty constant. And so I change the wavelength. I change my mouth to make different shapes and you hear different frequencies. If I want to make a real low frequency, I kind of push my lips out, right? Ooh. And if I want to make a high frequency, I kind of pull them in. I'm changing the shape of my mouth. That's this. The speed of sound never changes, and so the frequency can go up and down, right? And as I talk, as I talk, um, you hear different frequencies. Now, if I could magically change the speed of sound, and I made the same shapes, and I tried to make the same sounds, you would hear a different frequency. If we could magically make the speed of sound much higher, you would hear much higher frequencies. And we can do that by breathing in helium. The speed of sound is much higher in helium. And I know what you're thinking. If there's a gas that you can breathe in that makes your voice higher pitched, is there one that'll make it lower pitched? No, sorry. Yes, there is. Sulfur a hexafluoride. We can breathe that in and it makes our voice lower pitch. So we're going to do this demonstration with uh, Olga and Rachel. Who's going first? Um, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, helium first. Helium? Yeah. So, do you guys know what this book is? Yeah? It's a classic, isn't it? We're going to start off with reading a little bit from the book so you can kind of get an uh, understanding of where our voices are at. Then we're going to inhale certain gases and then you're going to hear what we sound like <laughs> <laughs> with these gases. That Sam I am, that Sam I am, I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am, I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. <laughs> Would you like them in a house? Would you like them with a mouse? I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. Would you eat them in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Not in a box, not with a fox, not in a house, not with a mouse. I would not eat them here or there. I would not eat them anywhere. <laughs> Grab, grab this, grab this, please. The, the cylinders, get the cylinders, thank you. Cylind right here. I can't let my students... I can't let my students have all the fun. Also, this gas is very expensive and I didn't want to waste any. You may have noticed the effect that the helium doesn't last that long because helium is lighter than air. It wants to float up out of your lungs. It doesn't stay in your lungs very long. But sulfur hexafluoride is much more dense. It wants to stay in your lungs and the effect lasts much longer. Also, Although these gases are not poisonous, you know, they're safe to breathe from that perspective, there's no oxygen in them. So you get a little lightheaded doing this experiment. <laughs> and I needed to give Olga and Rachel a chance to catch their breath because now they're going to tell you about resonance. So, this is a bowling ball on the end of a wire. This is our pendulum, and Galileo was the first to recognize that the frequency of vibration of an object is very similar to how fast it swings on a pendulum. So a pendulum shows that from one to the other, it'll swing the same distance at 
a very fixed rate. Now this bowling ball has a resonant frequency of about four seconds, so it'll go up and down and back to the same place in about four seconds. But what happens if we start hitting it, because we apply energy to make it start swinging, what happens if we start hitting it at a frequency that's not, um, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> that's not with that four seconds, let's say about two seconds. Rachel here's gonna demonstrate. Two, one, two, one, two. So essentially she's gonna start hitting it and you'll start to see that if she hits it every two seconds or so, it's not gonna really swing very much. And the energy she applies into it is about the same, but what if she starts hitting it at every four seconds approximately? Two, three, hit. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You can see it starts to swing a lot more, and this is after only about three pushes, versus the other one, it swang a little bit, but not that much. And again, if you apply the energy um, at the right time, it adds up and it starts swinging higher and higher. So that is how frequency works. So objects have a natural frequency they want to vibrate at, a resonant frequency. And uh, we, we just learned about swings. Swings have a certain frequency they want to vibrate at. Maybe you use a tuning fork to tune a musical instrument. If it has short tines, they can vibrate back and forth very quickly and it makes a high frequency sound. If they're longer, they can't vibrate back and forth as quickly, it makes a lower frequency sound. Even glasses and things have frequencies that they want to oscillate at. In fact, maybe you've been in one room of the house and somebody dropped something in the kitchen and you could tell sort of what it was. You, could, you knew it was a glass and not a dish or a metal lid to a pot, right? By the sound it makes because things have a certain frequency they want to vibrate at. So let's do this, maybe uh, may, uh, we'll do this little test here. I'm gonna drop something under the table and you see if you can tell what it is. That's our meter stick. Right, I heard wood, stick, you, maybe you knew it was wood. You knew it was long and thin, right? Not a big block of wood. So let's try another one. A metal rod, metal stick, right? Something long and thin, metallic. One more. A wrench. <laughs> Those of you kids that work on your own car, you recognize that sound, right? That's a distinct sound you, we know. <clears throat> okay, so what we've been talking about was that vibration causes sound. And what I wanna show you now is because everything has a certain very, very specific frequency it wants to vibrate at, if I had two tuning forks that wanna vibrate at exactly the same frequency, and we make one give off some sound, the sound, the air, is gonna push on the other one. And because both of these wanna uh, vibrate at the same frequency, the sound, even though air can't push on something very hard, because it's pushing at exactly the right frequency, it can cause this to start vibrating. So let's, let's take a look at that. Let's see if we can make that happen here. I have two tuning forks that are uh, the same. And I'll play this one for you, and I'll show you that when I stop the vibration with my hand, the sound stops. Okay, this one makes the same sound. Same frequency. Now, I'm gonna play the one uh, on this side and stop it, and we'll see if the other one gets vibrating. Okay. The sound from the first one caused the air molecules to push on the second one at just the right interval so it got some vibrations going that we noticed. Now I'm gonna see if I can get it to go back again. Let's listen carefully.
Okay, so if, because that works, because they're exactly the same frequency. Now I'm going to put a little weight on the top of this one. And it's going to change the frequency a little bit. This is what it sounded like before. This is what it sounds like now. To me, it sounds exactly the same, but we measured it. It's 10 hertz difference. One is uh, 1,250, the other is 1,240. Okay, so just a tiny bit different. Now let's see if we can get this one to vibrate. Nothing. Should we listen again? Nothing. Now let's take the weight off so they're the same frequency again. It has to be exactly the same frequency. <coughs> so if we push even little tiny pushes from the air molecules at exactly the right frequency can have a big effect. But this wasn't very exciting, this demonstration. What could we push on that would be much more fun and exciting? Maybe a wine glass. <coughs> so in the physics department, we break wine glasses all the time. <laughs> Except this time, we're going to try and do it with sound. Now, one of the things Frank just showed us is that if you can send the sound into an object at the frequency that the object just naturally wants to vibrate, you can make that object vibrate. So what we can do is we can, <laughs> we can tap our wine glass. And using our ears, we can find the exact right frequency to send in sound. Okay, maybe you could do that. Frank's ears and my ears aren't nearly that good, so we cheat. We have an app on our phone. Get it ringing. And I can show Frank exactly what frequency to tune the sound. So what Frank's going to do is he's going to dial that in. Hopefully we'll get that wine glass to vibrate a little bit. When Frank is feeling confident, he'll crank up the uh, amplitude and hopefully we'll shatter this wine glass. Oh, I'm hearing it. Now, while I clean glass off the stage, Frank is going to show us a video of a wine glass shattering in slow motion. That demonstration, I get excited every time that wine glass breaks because it is tough to do that demonstration. That's the hardest one we do. And this is why. Let's take a look at the super slow motion video. That's a glass. You might not think of a glass as being flexible, but look at how much it can flex. And that makes it very difficult to break. You've got to get it to flex beyond that point. And when you do that, the glass shatters. And you do that by hitting it at exactly the right frequency. If you're off by three or four tenths of a hertz, you won't do it. <coughs> and it's not just wine glasses, right? Everything has a, a natural frequency that it wants to oscillate at. Even bridges, this is a famous uh, bridge. It was built up in the state of Washington, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge back in the 30s. This is slightly different than resonance. They call it flutter, but it's, it's a similar concept. The wind was blowing at just the right speed. This is steel and cement. This is not a rubber bridge, right? Look at that. <coughs> Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Needless to say, the bridge didn't last very long. They actually made a, a replica, a little model of this later, put it in a wind tunnel and got to repeated that same pattern, vibration pattern. Uh, nowadays, they test uh, models of bridges in wind tunnels. Uh, but they, they did have a similar effect with the uh, Millennium Bridge. It was built for a World's Fair recently. It was a pedestrian bridge. And when people walked over it, it started to vibrate, and they closed it down and put some reinforcements in. 
So just to uh, recap sound and resonance, we talked about resonance, we talked about swings and wine glasses have a certain resonant frequency. We talked about bridges. I am told that soldiers don't march over a bridge, they break step, they walk over a bridge. Because when they march, their feet all come down at the same time, right? Boom, boom, boom. And if that rhythm happens to match the resonant frequency of the bridge, you can get it vibrating. And if you're the one walking over the bridge, you don't want to get it vibrating, right? And so they don't march, they walk, so everybody's feet come down independently and you don't get that additive effect. We talked about uh, mu uh, resonance, musical instruments. Most of them use that concept to make the sounds they make. We talked about our voice and how we make sounds. This is a cell phone. I am told that there are ringtones that you can download for your cell phone that you can hear, but your parents can't. <laughs> They are banking on the fact that they have lost the ability to hear high frequency. <coughs> See kids, you never know when your knowledge of physics will come in handy. <laughs> and please, please take good care of your hearing. It never gets better, it always gets worse. Take good care of your ears. The physics of sound all around us. <coughs> And that brings us to our last topic of the day, pressure. And we're going to start out by talking about atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is caused by the weight of all the air molecules above us being held to the Earth by gravity. Can you feel all the air molecules above us pushing down, right? Can you feel them pushing on you? No, right? You can't feel that because they're all around pushing on every side of us. We don't notice it. But if you were uh, horsing around with your friends and you jumped on the ground and your friends all started to pile on top, right? The person on top, hey, that's not so bad being on top, right? The person way on the bottom, they feel the weight of every person, right? It's bad being the one on the bottom. Well, the same is true here. If you're up on a mountain, you don't feel as much weight. You don't feel atmosphere, as much atmospheric pressure as when you're down on Earth here because on the surface of the Earth, uh, at sea level, I should say, because you have more stuff on top of you. <clears throat> and it's pushing on every side of you. So we don't notice it. But what we're going to try to show you now is when we can remove atmospheric pressure from one side of an object, then interesting things happen. We notice that. So what I I'm going to start out with this balloon. That balloon has a little bit of air in it, and it's tied off. And so the air inside of the balloon is trying to make the balloon bigger. And the atmospheric pressure is pushing from the outside, trying to make it smaller. And right now, everything's happy. And now we're going to use a vacuum pump to remove the atmospheric pressure from the outside of the balloon. Okay, there's our balloon now. Now with nothing pushing from the outside, the air on the inside wins and pushes the balloon bigger. And when we let the air back in, it goes back to where it was, right? And uh, now Rachel's going to show us a little bit more about atmospheric pressure. So what we have here is a stool. And atmospheric pressure is on all sides of the stool. On the top side, bottom side, left side, and right side. And I have this rubber mat. And when I place this rubber mat on top of the stool, there is no longer any atmospheric pressure between the rubber mat and the stool. But there is still atmospheric pressure pushing down on the rubber mat and pushing, down, or pushing up on the bottom of the stool. So when I go like this, and lift it up, the atmospheric pressure on the bottom of the stool is what keeps it up. Now I lower it back down, remove the rubber mat, and now atmospheric pressure is on all sides of the stool again. <laughs> and now we have these two discs. And because the atmospheric pressure is equal 
on the outside of the disks and inside of the disks, when I go like this, it's really easy to take them apart. But if we use this vacuum pump to suck out the air in between the disks, the atmospheric pressure will no longer be equal between the disks and on the outside of the disk. And we'll see exactly what that does. So now, the atmospheric pressure is greater on the outside and less on the inside. So even when I go like this, it's really hard. Frankel, demonstrate a little bit. Yeah, so it actually takes about 200 pounds hanging from these disks, or as I like to say, one franc. Or if I was in physics class, I'd say it's about 890 newtons to actually make these disks fall apart. And when I put the air back in, oops, wrong way, they fall apart. So what we've been talking about is removing atmospheric pressure from one side and leaving it on the other, and you see these amazing things happen. But we could, all you need is a difference in pressure, right? So, so what, we, uh, what we see is that we can leave atmospheric pressure on one side and add extra pressure to the other side and see amazing things also. And we're going to do that with this t-shirt cannon. We'll put a t-shirt in there, one side will have atmospheric pressure, the other side will pump up to a higher pressure, and then we'll see what happens. We're going to start out with two times atmospheric pressure. You go 30, 45, 60, right? <laughs> She's got another t-shirt. This time let's try three times atmospheric pressure. We have one more t-shirt. We're going to go to four times atmospheric pressure. If you didn't get a t-shirt, don't worry, they're for sale outside the theater. <laughs> if you're like me, and I know I am, you're wondering what we do with the money that comes in from t-shirt sales, from tickets, things like that. We think we're doing a lot of good things for physics education in Northern California. Check our website for a complete list. But by far the biggest thing, the best thing we do is bring Title I schools to Foothill College to see the physics show. Schools that are economically disadvantaged I had a number of teachers tell me this is the only field trip they're going on this year. They just can't afford it. We paid for everything. We provide the buses. We put on the physics show. The kids get a tour of the campus. They have lunch on campus. They even get a t-shirt. David likes to say every kid leaves with a t-shirt with a college on it that doesn't have anything to do with sports.
our future scientists and engineers. We target schools in uh, East Palo Alto, the Ravenswood School District, the Redwood City School District, and a number of school districts in San Jose. This was one day. We did four days just like this. 3,300 kids, what is that, about 100 classrooms? We want to thank you for making that possible. So we, we started talking about pressure, but we never really defined what pressure is. Pressure is force per unit area, force over area. What does that mean? It means if you're running around the house and you bump into the side of the table, not so bad. But you bump into the corner of the table, the same force concentrated on a small area, <laughs> ow, right? You feel that. We all know that, right? If David pushes on me with his open palm, not so bad. But if he pushes on me, same force with the tip of a needle, ow, right? I feel that very different. Maybe you've seen somebody chopping vegetables. If the knife is nice and sharp, the force concentrated on a small area goes right through the food. But if the knife is dull, the force is spread over a larger area. It doesn't have the same effect, right? We can even cut sheets of metal with a water jet if it's a fine enough point, if it's a high enough pressure. And we're going to do a little demonstration for you with two of our favorite things. <laughs> Balloons and nails. Natural friends. <laughs> so I'm going to give Frank a balloon. And he's going to carefully balance it on two nails and I'm going to cover my ears. Good job. But now we're going to put a weight on it. Bad news for the balloon. We're going to flip this board around, and now we're going to try and balance it on 20 nails. Two weights, three weights, four weights, five weights, six weights. We are all out of weights. But we need to be careful because Frank is sneaky. Sometimes he brings his indestructible balloon to the music show. <laughs> How can we test to see if this balloon is actually indestructible? <laughs> Put it back on the first two nails. Well, Frank, we've got a very sharp crowd with us today. Sharp as nails. I thought it might be indestructible for a second there, but it was not. It appears the number of nails makes a difference. If we put a balloon on two nails and we were to put 20 pounds of weight on top, each nail would have to hold up 10 pounds to hold up its share of the weight. But if we use 20 nails and put 20 pounds on top, each one only has to push with the force of one pound to hold up its share. The more nails there are, the less each one has to push to hold up its share of the weight. So Frank, let me see if I've got this right. If I put a balloon on two nails. Bad news for the balloon. But if I put a balloon on 20 nails. Not so bad. Frank, <laughs> does this work for things that aren't balloons? It does. Even physics students. <laughs> so Frank, if I put a physics student on two nails. Ooh, bad news for the student. <laughs> but what if I put a physics student on a whole bed of nails? Let's see what happens.
She's reminded me to put on my safety glasses because she doesn't want me to get hurt. <laughs> you can see what we're doing here, right? She's got a bed of nails underneath her, a bed of nails on top of her. We have carefully balanced the cinder block, and I've got a sledgehammer. Are you okay? She's good, no leaks. Now, there's a lot of good physics keeping her safe. It's not just top quality safety equipment. Now, the first thing I think is that Olga's kind of like a balloon. If we put her on two nails, bad news. But we put her on about 800 nails. With 800 nails, each nail only has to push up with a tiny amount of force. The second thing I think about is the concept of inertia. Now, we didn't talk about that at this physics show. Maybe we'll talk about it at the next physics show. But inertia means that if you are at rest, you want to stay at rest. And think about that. We had a bed of nails on top of her, and we had a cinder block on top of her. They had a lot of inertia. They want to stay at rest, even though the sledgehammer wanted to make them move. And finally, the last thing I think about with physics in that demonstration is that, man, that sledgehammer had a decent amount of energy as it was flying through the air. That energy went into shattering the cinder block. The fact that that cinder block shattered meant that it took a lot of energy, and that was energy that was not available for shattering Olga. <laughs> so there's a lot of really good physics in that demonstration. And it's just a fun, fun way for us to end our show. <clears throat> today, today we talked about light, sound, resonance, and pressure. Those are all topics under physics. Physics, physics is part of science. Did you have fun? Foothill Physics Instructor, David Marasco. And our students, Rachel Major. And Olga Kritova. I'm Frank Coscarano. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next year at The Physics Show.